Yeah, some churches handle snakes. We have live iguanas in our church. Um, I was uh, in the canyon last night. My uh, wife's father had passed away in January. We had a little memorial service for him down there, and I was talking to one of the older folks there. I said, I was just here Thursday. He said, what were you doing here Thursday? I said, we had 150 uh, kids here for VBS. And he looked at me and said, why? He goes, you Presbyterians are wild and crazy. I said, I've never heard that said about Presbyterians before. But it was really amazing to not just do VBS here, but to take kids into the canyon, into God's creation. It was fantastic. So really, uh, this staff is wonderful. So uh, Kelly, uh, Deb, Cassie, Draven, y'all stand up. Let's stand up. We'll give them a hand. <clears throat> it was fantastic. I'd stack it up against any VBS in the world. Speaking of kids, kids these days. What's wrong with kids these days? Every generation has said it. Traditionalists said it about the boomers. Boomers said it about Gen X's. Gen X's said it about millennials. Millennials really say it about Gen Z's. I work with, you know, in our middle school leaders, like Bryn Chanel's back there and Brinkley and others that drove that have been, when they were in high school and work with middle school kids, and they're like, after our middle school trip, they're like, these kids are crazy. What's wrong with these kids? It's only a few years. Here's a quote about children. Children these days now live in luxury. They have bad manners, a contempt for authority. They show disrespect to the elderly. They love to talk nonstop instead of exercising. They have become the tyrants, not the servants of their homes. They no longer stand when elders enter the room. They contradict their parents, interrupt adults, and they eat everything. Now, what generation was that? Who said that about what kids? Any guesses? How about this? Socrates in 830 BC. It's attributed to him. It was used again in his speech to the American Education Society in 1911. Every generation says, what's wrong with these kids? Every generation has said this about their children, but each generation has viewed children differently. And I want to take just a minute as uh, someone who, this is my realm. I've worked with students uh, and young people for over 45 years, started 21, when I was 21 in young life and college and uh, have continued to work with kids nonstop. It has changed. Every generation is different. And this is what society and sociologists and teen experts are saying. 50s and early 60s, there really wasn't such a thing as teenager yet. That word hadn't even been coined until mid, late 50s. The, the, the word for parents or their, their uh, motto, mantra was children should be seen and not heard. Children still worked on the farms. They had chores. The world was black and white. Parents' role was authoritarian. There was right and wrong. The shows were Leave it to Beaver, Andy Griffith, Father Knows Best. The number one movie was The Ten Commandments. There was not really youth ministry back then or children's ministry like now. There was confirmation. There was Sunday school with your coat and tie on. There were chaperones, not leaders. Church and Sunday school was mandatory. The parents went and kids went with them and went where they went. Mark Twain kind of captures even before that kind of the feeling about teenagers back then. Mark Twain said, when a boy turns 13, put him in a barrel and feed him through a knot hole. And when he turns 16, plug up the hole. Not very politically correct today. Mark Twain wouldn't be called woke. Then came the 60s and the 70s, late 60s, 70s, the love and peace movement. And the mantra was, these kids are growing up too fast. They're getting in trouble. Parents' role was to keep kids out of trouble, keep them from drinking and being sexually active, keep them busy to not drink or chew or go with those that do. The goal of parents was to graduate sober virgins, someone said. Youth ministry was born during this t turbulent time. Uh, young life, youth for Christ, navigators, crew. Uh, these ministries, children's ministry became not just a babysitting, but an actual ministry during this time. The idea was to keep kids out of trouble, keep them from being bored. We moved from just Sunday school with chaperones to informal clubs, activities, trips, retreats. Volunteers became leaders and friends. Church was still an expectation regardless of what kids had done that weekend. A quote from a, 60, uh, a mom of the 60s said, when my kids were out of control, I like to use a nice safe playpen. When they calmed down, I would climb out of it. That's Irma Bombeck. Here's another parent from the 70s. Suddenly one day I said to myself, what's the point of cleaning the house if my family insists on keep living here, on continuing to live here? <laughs> 
Then came the 80s and the 90s, that generation. The latchkey kids, the schoolhouse rock kids. Parents' role was to feed and house them and leave them alone. Their mantra was, the kids will be okay. They could get up on Saturday morning and leave on their bike and come home when the streetlights were off at night. The world was a safe place. Movies like E.T., The Goonies, Gremlins, Older for the Teenage, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Breakfast Club, Pretty in Pink. Today, the, the, the series Stranger Things is set in the 80s. Parents were basically absent, some incompetent, or they were portrayed, at least in movies and in TV, as absent, incompetent, or uncool. Par- parents are never there. Where were they? Youth ministry was another place to get kids away from their parents, or for, for kids to get away from their parents. Leaders were like surrogate parents. Parents still saw church as essential to kids' lives. Parents chose what church, and the kids got there. Ray Romano said this about raising kids in the 80s. He said, living with kids was like living in a frat house. Everything was broken. Nobody sleeps. There's a lot of throwing up. That's Ray Romano. Another parent said during the 80s, I'm going to write a parenting book called Fine, Whatever, Go Ahead. Then came the 2000 decade. Everything changed. The world became unsafe. Amber alerts on our phones, on the highway, 9-11, school shootings. Every day in the last two weeks, there's been some sort of shooting. Cyberbullying, COVID kids. The main thing parents say are kids are not safe. It is not a safe world. Parents' role, this is not criticizing. This is not pointing fingers. This is just what's happening in our society right now, and things to pray about. Parents' role has shifted from being to being the monitor, the protector, as opposed to the authority. Terms like soccer moms, helicopter parent, snowplow parent, remove every obstacle from the way, are being coined. Parents have moved from being the authority or being absent to being the best friends, the Gilmore girls. It's no longer movies, it's TikTok and Snapchat. Those are the parents. The number one motivation of most parents, unfortunately, is fear. The goal of parenting has become safety and happiness. My kids are safe and they're happy. Kids are not growing up too quickly. In fact, they're slowing down and growing up slower than ever. 20 is 18 or 19. 18 is 15. They're growing up slowly. They're slowing down. They're waiting later to get driver's license. How many of you got your driver's license the day you turned 16? You went there. I know kids that are 20 or 18 that don't have their driver's license. I know kids, they're, they're, they're waiting to later to get married. It used to be in the 60s, 70s, 21, 22 average age, 29 the average age to get married, getting careers later. Here's kind of the good news. Every statistic of teenage risk is down right now. They date less. Only 38% of high school seniors actually date. Compare that to 80% in the 60s and 70s. They drink less, there's less sexual activity. That sounds good, doesn't it? But here's the downside. More depression, more self-harm, higher anxiety, more antidepressant use than ever, more pornography and sexting than ever has been. Andrew Root, professor of youth and family ministry at Luther Seminary says this, in this time of being the hyper good parent, we're keeping kids safe so they can be happy now and in the future. The highest moral good in parents' mind right now is to protect their children through intense oversight, helping prepare them for the competitive rat race of modern society, helping them find happiness with who they are in this fast-paced life. The life of the parent has become their kids. Church has become the kid's choice, not the parents. Parents go where the kids go, if they go, when they go. Youth ministry and children's ministry is good to these parents, but not essential. Since the goal of parenting, and this is not a criticism, and I think our parents do a phenomenal job, but across the country and in the church, the goal of parenting is safety and kids' happiness instead of spiritual health. If you rank priorities that parents want for their kids these days, spiritual health and spirituality ranks about 18th in priorities, losing out very easily to sports, club sports, academics, social events, travel, etc. Spirituality is low on the list only during times of crisis. <clears throat> 70s, 80s, average Christian church attended church about 40 times a year, 40 times out of 52. Today, <laughs> the average church goer goes to church 18 times a year out of 52. 
that's just different. Sports grades have become the ultimate. Good things like sports and like club sports and, and, and making good grades and getting into college have not gone from being good things. They have become ultimate things. They have become the idols of our culture. Paul says that's not what it's about. Paul says in Scripture, for me to live is Christ. Everything else is secondary. Jesus says this, seek first the kingdom of God, and then all these good things will be added unto them. Our Westminster Confession says the chief end of man is to what? Be happy? (laughs) Be safe? No, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. No matter how safe our kids are, no matter how happy we want them to be, without Jesus, they will miss out on real life, on joy, on eternity, on becoming who they were created to be. How can we refocus away from just safety and happiness as the goal for our kids? Well, Jesus gives us the perfect picture. Jesus shows us how. Look at Mark 10. If you turn to Mark 10, verses 13 through 16, it's a simple story. It's something you've heard all your life, but in the light of today, let's look at this. Jesus is in the middle of his ministry, his disciples. It's exciting. Things are happening. He's popular. Adults are falling by the thousands. He is the man of the day. And this happens in Mark 10, starting 13. And they, being moms, were bringing children, the word there is infants, and, and the moms were bringing infants to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them, rejected them, turned them away. But when Jesus saw it, he was angry. He said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. He took them in his arms, blessed them, laying hands on them. This is the word of the Lord. See, there was no such thing as teenagers then. There was no such thing as adolescent. When you became 12, you were bar mitzvah, you were an adult, male and female, with responsibilities. But the disciples have that same problem that we had about kids, that old keep kids away. They should just be seen and not heard. They're off here. Keep them out of the way. They're not important. Women, children, no, it's about the men. It's about adults. This is the adult table. This is adults speaking here, that mentality. And the moms are coming and say, can, can Jesus hold my child? Can he, my child sit in his lap? No, he's too important. Son, he's the Messiah. He's too important for that. And Jesus is like, stop it. You're completely wrong. You're upside down wrong. That is exactly the opposite of what I think. (laughs) Bring those children to me. And he picks them up, and he holds them, and he blesses them. How are we getting in the way of our kids, even with good intentions, of coming and sitting in the lap of Jesus? How are we holding kids back? In Colorado Springs, in front of the Compassion International Headquarters, There's a statue called Big Jesus. (laughs) It's a big statue. It's that that kid right there is about regular size. It's a Big Jesus statue. And it's this verse lived out. And they built this. The artist, the sculptor, put it in front of the headquarters of Compassion International. And guess what started happening? They'd come early to work one morning, and there'd be a homeless man sitting on Jesus' lap next to that little kid. They come out at work at night and dark, and there'd be a businessman with a briefcase sitting in the lap of Jesus crying. There'd be a mother sitting there crying. There'd be an elderly woman coming there to die on Jesus' lap. One year, the mayor was found sitting in Jesus' lap. They wanted to be where Jesus was. How do we continue to encourage our kids to come and be blessed? How do we bless the children? And bless means to celebrate, to lay hands on, to, to, have, to speak over, to speak good things, to, to, com- to convey the covenant, to say you're beloved. How do we do that for our children, our young people? I'm gonna share three quick things with you. And just so you know, uh, I didn't make this up. They say that originality is forgetting who you stole it from. So I stole this. Three things, just to challenge us as parents, grandparents, friends of kids, as a church. Three things that need to happen for our children to be blessed, to sit in Jesus' lap. Number one, let them know they belong in the family of Jesus. They belong here. 
Number two, help them to believe in Jesus as their Savior and Lord. Number three, encourage them to behave like Jesus because they are loved by him, because they are loved. Belong, believe, then behave. If you get those out of order, you're in trouble. It becomes works. Let's talk about belonging. There's never been such a divided culture. No generation has faced such a divided culture. The wokeness, the cancel culture, it's never been so polarized. It's, it's a struggle. But listen to these words. Anybody ever been to the Statue of Liberty on Liberty Island? Anybody been there? Yeah, who's been to the Statue of Liberty? What's the poem on the Statue of Liberty? It says this. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Bring the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Not politically correct today. Send to us the homeless, the tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. But that's plagiarism too, isn't it? Jesus says like this about kids belonging. Not only do you belong here, but you belong in our church. You belong in the body of Christ. You belong in the lap of Jesus. Matthew 11, 28, 29, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I'm gentle and humble in heart. Jesus says, you want to know what I'm like? I'm gentle and humble in heart. You'll find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My load is light. You belong here with me, regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your political view, regardless of your confusion about sexual identity, regardless of your failures, your mistakes, your income level, your tattoos, your hair color. You belong to Jesus. Come sit in my lap. Kids need to know they belong. John 1, 12, behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we can be called the sons and daughters of God. Do kids know that? The church is a place where they belong. When they drive by, they see a playground. They see an A&O house. They see kids and adults. Do kids know they belong? In Jesus' lap, they belong here. We want them here. I've been able to do A&O now for seven years. It's kind of fun now Now that the kids I started with are getting married. They're getting jobs. They're you know, like Draven, Brinkley, others. I'm doing A&O weddings. That's how old I am. But what's fun is those kids will come together. We do a welcome back home with college kids, and they'll go, you know what? I'm not bragging. It's just the Lord. You know what my best memories were in high school? Being in church, being at A&O, going on trips. You know who my best friends are? Christians, kids that I met in church and ministry at A&O. The others have, I used to play ball with or used to do that, but the ones I shared Jesus with, those are still my best friends. They belong. Besides belonging, then they, then they believe. See, they have to feel like they belong here before they'll start believing. If they don't belong here, they won't come and hear about Jesus. If they don't think that Jesus wants them, they won't believe. Romans 10, 9, 10, what do they believe? The, just the gospel. <laughs> you know, confess with your heart that Jesus is Lord and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That's it. We need to know, kids need to know what to believe. And it's just a very simple, the gospel is simple. In fact, I'm going to show you how simple it is. I'm going to ask uh, one of our kiddos to come up and I'm going to interview her about kind of what she thinks, what she believes. Let me get my questions. Ruby, you want to come on up here, kiddo? Give Ruby a hand. This is brave. <laughs> All right, Miss Ruby. Tell them your name real quick. Ruby. What is it? Ruby. How old are you? Look out here. Six. Where do you go to school? Wolfland Elementary. All right. Wolfland Wolves, right? That's fantastic. Um, what was your favorite thing about BBS, you said, besides my wife's iguana? Yeah. <laughs> That's so great. She'll be excited to hear that. It'll just, she's going to want to go buy more animals now. Thanks a lot. Hey, what's your favorite dessert? Chocolate cake. Yeah, I like that. So just a simple question, Ruby. Do you believe in predestination or free will uh, as essential for salvation? I don't know that question. You what? You, you, okay, here's, here's an easy one. So are you a four-point or a five-point Calvinist or a hyper-Calvinist, and why? Four-point, five-point, you know, tulip. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, this is easy. Um, what do you think about uh, limited atonement, double predestination? Um, I don't know that. <laughs> okay, easier question. So do you think that socialism and maybe a liberal agenda is better, or would you go with uh, capitalism and kind of the trickle-down theory as far as econ our, our economics? I can't answer that. Kids these days. <laughs> How about this? What do you believe about Jesus? That he loves us and he cares about us. Mm -hmm. Thanks, sweetie. Good job. I couldn't do that at that age. The gospel is simple. What do kids need to believe to be saved? It's as simple as ABC. Paul said it like this, 1 Corinthians. He said, <laughs> when I came among you, I did not come with flattering speech. I'm quoting it here. It says, brethren, when I came unto you, I came not with excellency of speech or wisdom, proclaiming to you the wisdom of God. For I desire to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's all kids need to know to be saved. They don't need to know where we stand on abortion or on critical race theory or on evolution or on this or that. That's for later. That's important stuff. We should know our theology. But to be saved, it's as simple as ABC. Admit that you're a sinner. Believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. Commit your life to him. The main things are the plain things. The plain things are the main things. No Jesus plus. They just need to know that Jesus loves them and died on the cross for them, and they can follow him. Great job, Ruby. Karl Barth, great German-Austrian theologian, had written for 30, 40 years, original Hebrew, Greek, Latin, translated, hermeneutics, exegetical, book after book after book, one of the best-known theologians of his day. One time, speaking at a college conference, a college kid said, okay, so can you, Dr. Barth, just simplify, tell me what the most important thing you ever learned, uh, in, uh, what's the most important theological statement you've ever heard? He goes, well, that's simple. I was sitting in my mother's lap, and she sang me this song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. He goes, that's it. That's the most important thing. Are we teaching kids that, and not Jesus plus anything else, not our nationalism, not our denominationalism, not our <laughs> political view, that Jesus loves them and died on the cross for them? Keep it simple. So they belong. What do they believe? And then comes behave. And by the way, as church and as a society, we've gotten it backwards. We want kids to behave and then maybe believe and belong. It never works that way. Kids can't behave. We can't behave until we know we belong, until we believe in Jesus. Because only Jesus can change the heart. Several years ago when I was on Young Life staff, I mean, some of you heard this story, but it just it tells it so true. We were at Frontier Ranch, a Young Life camp, and I was one of the uh, speakers there. And we brought in pastors from all over the country, Baptist, Presbyterian, Catholic priests, all these pastors, to come and watch camp for a week, how we do camp. And they were amazed, these street kids, non-Christian kids, rough, tough non-Christian kids, because Young Life was evangelical. It wasn't discipleship. It wasn't church. It was reaching non-Christian kids for Christ. I spent 20 years of my life going after kids who didn't believe. And it's all going well. One night, we're walking out of dinner. We're going to the meeting. And over here is what they call the circles, the smoker circle. And it's rocks, and it's a pit. It's where the kids would go and smoke. And we got to there, and these pastors were livid. Kids are smoking here? How dare they smoke? This is a Christian camp. These kids can't be smoking. <laughs> and I remember our director, he looked over and said, ladies and gentlemen, we want to save their hearts, not their lungs. We want to save their hearts first. Jesus will take care of the rest. Sometimes we get behavior modification in place <laughs> of saving their hearts first. Because they can be clean, sober virgins and never smoke a cigarette and never say a cuss word and never get involved sexually and still go to hell without Jesus. Behavior only happens after they know their love. John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Keller says that's the problem with religion. Religion says this, 
I obey, therefore I'm loved. The gospel says this, I'm loved, therefore I will obey. Believe, belong, become before behave. There's no good kids or bad kids. There's only kids that don't know Jesus and kids that do. It's the same with adults. So there it is. Belong, believe, behave. But what about the future? What about the next generation? Guess what generation is coming behind Gen Z's quickly? They're called Gen A, Gen Alpha. They're going to be the largest generation in the history of American culture. The most kids ever are in Gen Alpha. What about them? I have two friends I've done premarital counseling with, two couples, and they both said to me, shockingly, we don't want to have children because we don't want to bring them into such a screwed up world. That's sad. That's how fearful it is. What about Gen Alpha? How are they going to respond? I'm going to be very self-serving right now. It's two years ago. My granddaughter, Willow, she's five, in Denver, Colorado. It is shut down. I mean locked down. No school. Masks everywhere, every place. She hasn't seen her friends. She hasn't been to church. There's no church. It's online. There's race riots going on about a mile from where they live in Denver. And one morning, my daughter wakes up and catches her doing this. What about the next generation? <clears throat> Do they know they're loved? It says, you say I'm loved when I can't feel a thing. You say I'm strong when I think I'm weak. You say I'm held when I'm falling short. And when I don't belong, oh, you say I'm yours. I believe. That is what the Holy Spirit is going to do to the next generation if we pray and we love them and let them belong and believe, then they'll behave. There's a prophecy about this next generation. It's in Joel 2.28, it's in Acts 2.17. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. I believe. What about you? Do you know where you belong to Christ? Do you know that you belong to Christ as his beloved? Do you believe with the faith of a child that he is your Lord and Savior? Are you living like Christ asked you to, not so he will love you, but because he loves you? Jesus challenges us to have not a childish faith, but a childlike faith. Isaiah says, a little child shall lead them. How about we follow them to the lap of Jesus? Amen.